over my years in construction, I've been witness to the changes in diversity in fields of architecture and engineering from what was almost an exclusively white male dominated profession to one that today represents more the diversity that's in our population. We see that in our departments here in architecture. And if you're out in the field, you can see that in engineering too. But on the construction site, whether you're speaking about general contractors or subcontractors or construction managers, craftspersons, tradesperson, that's not been the case. And so just as our general society has to address diversity, so must we uh, in, on the construction site. So to, today we've got two presenters uh, with firsthand experience, and they're going to speak about the successes and challenges that exist out on the construction site. So first is Lisa Clausen is here. And Lisa is, oh, I got to get my paper here. Lisa is uh, the Director of the Strategic Partnership for Central and Western Mass for the Carpenters Labor Management Program. And this program is a partnership with the Carpenters Union, the New England Regional Council of Carpenters, and hundreds of contractors in New England who employ union car carpenters. Ms. Clausen brings 25 years of community and union organizing experience, and she is the founder and former head of the Boston-based Community Labor United. Our second presenter, presenter comes to us from a little different perspective. Stephanie Stevens is a third-year carpenter apprentice in Local 336. And she grew up, she's local, grew up here in the Springfield area. She joined the Army when she was 17 and served for three years, including two combat deployments to the Middle East. She's currently working here at UMass Amherst on the student union, union renovations. So perhaps she'll be speaking about her journey from the Middle East to Amherst and speaking about her experiences in the construction environment. But before we begin, I think that it's most appropriate that we thank Ms. Stevens for her service. So my name is Lisa Clausen, um, and uh, with me is Stephanie Stevens. Um, and up here on the slide is an overview of what we're going to talk through today. Um, my plan is to start with giving you an overview of the demographics of the construction industry talk through why diversity should matter in construction, and take you through who is doing what to change the industry. I'll talk about how they're doing it and what the industry best practices are for achieving greater diversity. And then we'll finish up with hearing from Stephanie uh, about her experiences as a woman of color in the construction industry. Um, she's a third year carpenter's apprentice. Our apprenticeship program is four years long. Um, as mentioned, I work for the Carpenters Labor Management Program, and we're a partnership of the New England Regional Council of Carpenters, which is also called the Union, and the hundreds of uh, contractors who employ our members. Um, among other responsibilities, I work to recruit women and people of color into the union, and then I also work to get owners of construction work to require diversity on their construction projects. So during this talk, I'll share information um, from two groups who are working to increase gender equity in the trades. Um, one is the uh, policy group on tradeswomen's issues, and the other is the Northeast Center for Tradeswomen's Equity. Both are based in Boston, and both work to increase women in the union construction trades, and many of the best practices that I'm going to share and examples of projects hitting strong diversity numbers come from their work. I'm a part of those organizations. Um, so you'll hear me reference their acronyms of uh, NCTE and BGTI. Um, I do have some handouts for those interested at the end um, that uh, references different studies and, and information that I give out today. Um, and I'll allow plenty of time for questions at the end, but also if there's uh, more information you'd like on anything that I talk about, I'm happy to share that. So. Uh, let's get started. So um, there is a diversity problem in the construction industry at large. Um, when you include everybody, architects, project managers, all aspects of construction management, um, 
women of all backgrounds are in short supply, except as kind of girls in the office who are doing the admin uh, jobs. Men of color are also underrepresented. Um, and while the diversity shortfall in construction affects all aspects of it, um, my focus is on the trades workforce. Um, and it's uh, the trades workforce are people working with the tools. And in this work, people of all backgrounds, women of all backgrounds, are just ridiculously underrepresented, as you can see from the numbers there. Um, nationally, 3% of women um, of the trades workforce is women. Uh, in different pockets of the country where aggressive work has been done to change this picture, those numbers are better, um, particularly in the Pacific Northwest, in California. And then recently, Boston has been making some inroads um, and uh, have been able to, in Boston, they've been able to increase their numbers to about 6 to 7% of the workforce. Um, in our region, both Central and Western Mass, it's 2%. Women will make up only 2% of the industry. Um, and we know this because there have been recent disparity studies that were commissioned by um, uh, the cities of Springfield and Worcester, and the Carpenters Union played a role in it, as did the Building Trades Council, we hired researchers out of UMass Boston who did these studies looking at uh, who's currently in the industry and who is out there who could be recruited to come into the industry. Um, so I have those studies as well and also another piece I'd be happy to share. Um, they looked at, um, uh, they covered, Springfield study covered Hamden County, Hampshire and Franklin and Worcester covered Worcester County. Um, what the studies found in terms of men of color uh, they found that African-American men were slightly underrepresented. Uh, Latino men tended to be well-represented in construction, but in the lowest paid and the lowest skilled jobs. Um, the disparity studies did not address exploitation um, and wage theft, but other industry studies have um, looked at those issues. The Attorney General, Maura Healy, has issued uh, regular reports on wage theft, and um, Tom Jurovich from UMass Labor Center has also um, put together a pretty comprehensive report on the subject. What those studies have found is that um, too often workers, particularly immigrant workers in construction, are being exploited, um, and wage theft is an epidemic problem uh, in our industry. Um, too often we see construction managers who are doing the see no evil, hear no evil uh, kind of approach where um, they are you know, saying, well, we don't know what our subs are doing or what the sub-subs are doing. We have no control over that. But yet when they're getting bids back that are extremely low, they're not asking questions about why those bids are coming back um, so much lower than everybody else. Um, and unfortunately, when that's happening, the workforce is usually overwhelmingly Latino. Um, and often wage theft is a part of the package with workers being paid cash. Um, taxes not being paid, workers' compensation not being paid, so if they get injured on the job, um, it's going to be their responsibility. And sometimes, oftentimes, workers aren't being paid at all. We get calls frequently from workers um, asking for help, and we work with them to get their wages back. So stealing from workers should not be an accepted business practice, nor should pretending to not know about it be a part of the job. Um, so back to gender diversity, here are some basic stats. Um, comparing trades workers to other professions over the years, as women increasingly entered the formal work world, the percentages of women in different professions have increased over time. Um, many industries have changed, um, though some have been very resistant and, resistant and slow to change. And while there are still gender inequities in many professions, including construction management, Trades workers is an industry with the most room for growth. Uh, there are definitely still people who think women can't do this work as successfully as men. Um, myths of this type have generally been debunked, and women have proven themselves in construction and other similarly physically demanding jobs, such as the armed forces. Um, uh, but um, uh, there continue to be detractors who, who view women as, as being unable to do the work. Men of all sizes and body types are successful working in construction, and the same is true of women. Um, some men coming into this work will not be successful, and the same will be the case with women, but where those people fail, many more are successful uh, and are able to become strong and capable workers if given the opportunity uh, to do so. 
Um, we have currently, we have a very successful foreman with a bridge contractor. She's about 5'1". She's maybe 110 pounds. Um, she's doing concrete work. Um, we also, one of our most experienced members and uh, women members in our union who's been in about 17 years now uh, is maybe 5'2", <laughs> maybe about 120 pounds. Um, and she's constantly in demand. She's constantly employed because she's uh, holding up her end of the work. So I'm going to turn now to the basic question of why does diversity matter in construction? And uh, the quick, easy answer is, of course, that it's 2019. It's the right thing to, to do. But beyond the easy equity answer, there are business reasons to care about diversity. Um, first of all, though, in terms of equity, uh, as you know, as you all know, construction work can lead to great careers. Uh, people who do it do it because they like working with their hands. They like taking pride in what they can do and in, in building complex structures um, and problem solving that the jobs require. Our members and the men and women in other trades work hard for their salaries. The work is really grueling physically on their bodies. They have to manage the constant uncertainty of when this job is going to finish, what the next job will be, when the next job will be. Um, but they do it because they can earn a solid living doing this work without having an advanced degree, and for some, despite having past quarry issues. When union, these careers can enable people to support themselves and their families and have good retirements. When union, there are no gender pay gaps and there are no racial pay gaps uh, because the contracts require equitable, equitable wages based on your apprentice level or if you're a journey, journey level status. There are, though, access gaps to opportunities to getting access to the work. Um, and in terms of diversity being the smart thing to do, research has, has made a strong business case for diversity. Study after study has shown that women and people of color in workplaces improve results, bring new ideas forward, and help teams innovate. And the construction industry is no different in this regard. Um, I've heard from different contractors and union business agents uh, that women on the job sites often add professionalism to them. There are no gender absolutes. Um, many people, though, have told me that they've experienced tradeswomen to have a greater attention to detail. And because women often have to be more professional to gain acceptance on the job site, they can sometimes lift the professionalism up on that job site. Um, it's a step that's in the best interest for all of us, including GCs and owners, when that happens. Another point is, is that the construction workforce is aging and not too far off their projected worker shortfalls. Um, there's a need for more people to come into the field and to become trained in the field, and women and people of color uh, provide opportunities on this front. Bottom line, more owners and end users are caring about diversity, so more the more you and your company understand it and understand how to achieve it, the more marketable you will be. Um, I'll speak shortly about where this is happening and who's requiring it. Um, right now, though, I'll give you two recent examples on this point. Um, recently in Worcester, the YWCA of Central Mass had a construction project. They underwent a search for a construction manager for a renovation and expansion project. Um, the OPM did the search, narrowed a list down, recommended a CM. Uh, time and money was spent on the search. However, diversity experience and performance were not taken into consideration. And the YWCA board, when told of who was chosen, ended up pushing back against the CM recommendation, in part over the lack of focus on diversity as part of their construction plan and as part of that CM's experience. The board also wanted to see union wages paid, and the CM was open shop. Um, as a result of the pushback, the YWCA and the OPM ended up walking back their decision and doing a new search. And the open shop contractor lost the job in part because of the lack of diversity experience. Um, he could have committed to hiring union subs to address the union issue that the board cared about, but he didn't have experience in achieving diversity on his jobs. Uh, another example is Shawmut Construction. Uh, they were awarded a job at Mount Holyoke College to renovate and expand their student center. Uh, there were no diversity requirements or goals on the job, but we approached Shawmut about voluntarily putting diversity goals on it. 
um, and which we would then uh, promote with Mount Holyoke, and it likely would be appreciated by them and could set them up well for future jobs that require diversity. Shaw had had their eye on Smith College, um, Nielsen Library build. Um, it was coming up, the selection was coming up, and they felt that they could then use this job at Mount Holyoke to prove that they both cared about diversity and that they could achieve diversity. Um, they ended up uh, getting the Nielsen Library job. And of course, a lot of consideration, a lot of different factors go into who uh, uh, Smith would choose for such a big job. But diversity was certainly a factor in the consideration and helped um, strengthen their consideration for it. Um, at different points in this presentation, I'm focusing on work being done to bring women into the construction trades versus women and people of color. Um, recruiting women to the trades is a leading priority in construction diversity because it's the leading problem in construction diversity. Um, however, when we focus on recruiting women, generally half who come in are women of color. Um, NCTE and PGTI have found this to be true in the Boston area where the percentages of people of color are higher. But I've also found it to be true in Western Mass as I've been doing recruitment over the last few years. And in terms of tracking diversity, which I'll talk about a little more about how that's done, NCTE, PGTI, and the Carpenters Union all support double and triple counting uh, to incentivize hiring women of color. This means that a woman of color would be counted on the job as both a woman and as a person of color. Um, and if the job also has re uh, requirements on veteran status or residency, she might also fall under those categories as well. Clearly, a woman of color is both a woman and a person of color, and so should be credited um, and counted in that way. Um, and many jobs, as they're starting to track diversity, they have a certain number of a certain percentage of women work hours that they're working to achieve and a percentage of people of color work hours. Um, so the bottom line is hire more women on your jobs, and your numbers will also increase people of color on those jobs. Um, for years, the focus on addressing um, the gender gap in construction was to keep recruiting more women to construction work. Aggressive work was done um, on this front time and time again, and yet the overall numbers year to year stayed the same in the industry. Um, the numbers started changing when aggressive recruitment was paired with owners requiring diverse work crews from the contractors that they hired. So supply plus demand needed to be a part of the solution. And I'm going to share with you what's being done on the recruitment front and then focus in particular on what's being done to require diversity and how that's being done. One of the questions I often get when I'm approaching different institutions and asking them to start setting diversity goals or requirements on their work is can these numbers be met? You know, if they require diversity, are there women trades workers out there, people of color trades workers out there that they can, that are skilled, that they can get their job done. Um, and there's a lot of work that's being done that's going into recruiting people for the work um, that has created um, uh, uh, plenty of people who are skilled and capable of, uh, of doing this work. So I'm gonna take you through some of the highlights of what's being done on this front. Um, it focuses on the whole on women, but some of it also includes recruiting men of color. Um, so first of all, the Mass Gaming Commission funded NCTE um, and a professional ad agency to develop a website and a uh, advertising campaign, with the result of which is Build a Life That Works campaign. And so it's this website, Build a Life MA, um, and it's a great website that has information and videos on each of the different trades, it has information on what the qualifications are, what the work entails, how to go out applying. Um, if you're not sure what trade you're in interested in, it has information on pre-apprenticeship programs that are available. And the PR firm also created materials for job site scrims, for billboards, for buses, um, uh, some of which are, there's some up in Springfield, there's a bunch up in the Boston area as well. And when a person goes to the website, if they provide contact info on it, if they register on the site, someone from NCTE will follow up with them, answer questions, and direct them in uh, how to move forward based on what their interest is and what their background is. 
So for example, if they don't know which trade to consider, they might be recommended to explore a pre-apprenticeship program. Or if they know they wanna be electrician, um, they'll be told what the qualifications are and what the process is for becoming an electrician in their area. NCT has also put together regular outreach meetings where women interested in the trades can get more information and meet um, existing tradeswomen in the region um, and hear from them about the work. Um, these events are called Tradeswomen Tuesdays and they happen monthly in Boston and every other month in our region. And overall, NCTE refers uh, to itself as the GPS versus the Lyft or the Uber. Um, they're showing women the way to the trades, but they're not taking them all the way there. Uh, women need to have the motivation and the interest to be able to follow through. Um, and uh, if they're going to succeed in this industry, then they have to have a, a real desire for it. And NCT doesn't have the capacity to kind of hold people's hand every step of the way but they will uh, help people figure out which direction and what information to get. So this is just kind of some of the information, um, some of the screenshots from the website, one of the flyers, um, and I've got more up here listing out the different Western Mass uh, Tradeswomen Tuesdays, something that Stephanie could talk about as well, who participates in them. All right, so some other aspects of recruitment work um, happens through vocational schools, pre-apprenticeship programs, and through outreach to community organizations. Um, personally, I found that some of our best recruits in this region have come from farming. Uh, women who are, who are in farming enjoy working outdoors. They enjoy working with their hands, seeing something from their efforts. They don't mind hard work, long hours, and construction is actually shorter hours and better pay uh, than, than agriculture is. Um, on the vocational front, 15 to 20 percent um, of construction trades programs in vocational schools have girls in them. Uh, so 15 to 20 percent of all those programs are girls, and yet the numbers coming into the trades at the end have been less than 1 percent. And so we're working to change that through girls in trades career fairs, which are bringing together vocational girls um, two career fairs where they're meeting tradeswomen, learning about opportunities, learning about apprenticeship programs, meeting contractors, um, and um, getting questions answered about uh, the job opportunities. We've been currently holding two a year, one in Boston that attracts the Eastern Mass vocational schools, and one uh, we just had a couple weeks ago in Springfield at Stick that um, drew schools and girls from schools in Central and Western Mass. At the one we just had, March 14th, we had 300 girls attend it. Um, there were probably about 20 tradeswomen from all different trades who, were, who took the day off from work and were talking to them about their work. And then um, 35 contractors and apprenticeship programs who were at it. Um, we also encourage schools to bring not just construction trades programs, but girls in agriculture, or girls in automotive, other programs that are hands-on that might have interest in going into these fields. And um, schools have brought 9th, 10th, and 11th graders, not just seniors, so the girls are learning early that this is a career path that they could, uh, they could move to. So here are a few pictures from um, our event this past uh, couple weeks ago. Um, we had the Lieutenant Governor, Karen Polito, join us, along with um, the State Secretary of Labor, Rosalind Acosta, the top picture is a workshop of tradeswomen talking to the girls about the pros and cons of the trades, being honest with people, and also being really encouraging um, about it. Uh, the bottom pictures are school pictures. Um, on the left is, I think, Blackstone Valley Tech, and uh, Putnam from Springfield is on the right. Um, one last piece on recruitment is that the disparity studies that were done for Central and Western Mass were done really conservatively, and they took a look at what are the, the characteristics that the Department of Labor says that make a good carpenter or make an electrician? And the Department of Labor has about 100 and uh, plus different elements um, of a job that make someone uh, good at, e at every field. And then they looked for a certain symmetry of other jobs that also had those characteristics that um, you could recruit people from. So um, they looked at some, you know, there were obvious ones like, um, you know, the armed forces or manufacturing or recycling that are physically demanding jobs that people come to or farming. But then there are also other jobs like being a CNA and, you know, you're on your feet a lot and you're lifting, 
you know, heavy people and you're having to do a lot of physically demanding work that could translate um, over. They took a pretty conservative approach on it. What we found, though, is that there is, of course, no cookie cutter mold, that we've, re we've recruited men and women coming from a whole line of different work who have been, you know, in retail, driving for Uber, being a stay-at-home parent, working in food service, um, coming from all different uh, backgrounds. And um, people who are coming to this work and are successful are people who are enjoying the actual work um, and don't mind then the physical demands and enjoy those aspects of it. Um, but what they were doing right before they came to this work is not necessarily a reflection of whether they would be successful uh, in doing construction. Um, apprenticeship programs are the easiest ways to bring in women and people of color into the trades. They provide a structure for new people uh, to learn the skills on the job, to be paid while they earn and while they learn, um, and to have a structured le learning program as well. These statistics here um, were put together by PGTI, but they come from the Division of Apprenticeship Standards, which is the state office that oversees registered apprenticeship programs. Um, as you can see, the open shop world is lagging in training apprentices and lagging even more in bringing in women and people of color to this work. Um, on the positive front, the union world has been aggressively increasing opportunities for women and people of color. And PGTI on their site breaks it down by trade. So certainly some unions are doing a better job, and some unions still have a lot of uh, uh, progress and work to be done to diversify as well. Um, I've read a few articles lately and heard some talk about a current shortage of skilled construction workers. I'm not sure if you guys have heard that as well. Um, coming from a union where we invest heavily in the workforce training and are consistently turning down interested people, we have a certain number of apprenticeship slots based on how many jobs we have available. And we have easily four times as many people applying for those slots as we, as we have capability to take people in. Um, so the way we see it is that there's a current shortage of skilled construction workers willing to work for low wages. Um, but if more contractors are paying decent wages, um, uh, union training programs would gear up and would, you know, expand and, and take in more people. Um, within the Carpenters Union, despite having more people applying for the apprenticeship program than we have jobs to place them in, um, we do keep an eye on our region's demographics and our desire to represent the communities where we work. So since our numbers of women is not as high as we'd like it to be, we do prioritize them in the application process. Um, this means that we have not changed our qualifications or standards at all, um, but we've worked to expedite the process. So when a woman is applying, the waiting period might not be as long for an interview um, as it is for sometimes for men. Um, and we keep an eye in the same way around men of color. Um, currently in Central and Western Mass, our local, local 336, um, of the apprentices over the four years, 16% uh, are women, and 36 are people of color. 36%, sorry, 16%, not 16 of them. Um, so there's a growing focus um, and trend towards diversity in construction. Um, some owners are requiring diversity and set it up as goals, and some are setting it up as requirements. Um, both approaches can be really effective if they're paired with best practices on how to um, measure it and how to enforce it and how to follow up on it. Um, to the same end, both can be ineffective and on paper only if they're set as goals or requirements and then nothing is done and no follow up is had. Um, if the owners just set it as a goal or a requirement and don't do anything on it. On the public construction side, there are federal and state guidelines um, and increasingly there have been municipal ones. Um, on the federal level, if a dollar is, is uh, federal money comes into a project, then it triggers the requirements. Um, all of these jobs focus on percentages of work hours as opposed to numbers of workers. Um, and most of the jobs in our states are reflections of what the federal requirements are. Um, so these federal requirements of 6.9% and 15.3% were set back in 1978 under the Carter administration. Uh, it's pretty crazy. Um, and because they haven't yet been achieved, they haven't been changed. <laughs> uh, 
And we don't quite, I haven't been able to, I did some digging to figure it out, but haven't come up with answers on how they came up with the 6.9%, the, the strange percentage numbers, and the 15.3. I think it was probably some sort of analysis based on who they could bring into the industry, um, but, but I haven't figured out what, the, uh, what they used to do that. Um, so towards the end of Deval Patrick's uh, tenure as governor, he set a, an executive order um, establishing these percentages to be goals for all state construction work. Under the Baker administration, the order remains in effect, um, but it varies um, by department in terms of enforcement. And under Deval Patrick, it also varied by department in terms of enforcement. So DCAM oversees the most state construction uh, work, um, and unfortunately, I've just not found them to, to focus at all around diversity um, and to do any enforcement of the diversity goals. Uh, Mass DOT uh, seems to care about the numbers, talks about the numbers, but centrally hasn't put any best practices into place and has left it up to each region to determine how they're going to implement the goals. Um, and it's varied, with some regions doing very little and some being a, few more, a bit more assertive. Um, there are two state agencies, though, that have been doing a really um, strong job and very effective diversity um, enforcement. And one is the UMass Building Authority, or UMBA, um, and the other is the Quasi-Public Mass Gaming Commission. Um, and so when I go through the best practices, I'm going to detail what these agencies have done that have made them so effective. Um, but then let me just touch on who else is taking a look at diversity. So municipally, um, more areas are supporting diversity requirements, um, often in conjunction with residency requirements, sometimes with veteran requirements as well. Um, and it makes sense for municipalities to ensure that public dollars are, that are going out are being used to create jobs that benefit their residents. Um, and sometimes they're doing it with city contracts, sometimes it's with public uh, tax breaks, TIFs or HDIPs um, that are given out. Um, and in our region, um, uh, Holyoke and East Hampton are currently considering municipal ordinances that put in diversity components and residency components. Springfield just hired new compliance officers to oversee um, their compliance and revamped their whole compliance oversight process to make it more in line with what UMBA is doing, what the UMass Building Authority is doing. They've come out here to UMass compliance meetings, check them out train their staff on um, how UMass Building Authority is doing it, and they're tr taking a similar approach. Worcester is also putting new systems into place. Uh, Worcester just hired a project manager for their ballpark uh, construction project, $250 million project that's coming up. And that compliance, uh, that project manager came out also to an UMBA compliance meeting recently um, to check out what's being done and, and how to oversee diversity. Because the uh, Worcester Redevelopment Authority set diversity requirements for that work. Um, as a result of all the work going to promote um, construction diversity in Boston, most of the jobs now are 7% women um, and higher. Um, the city of Boston, as a result, recently increased what its um, uh, requirements are for diversity. It was 5% women work hours, and they've now upped it to 10% work hours. Um, their people of color requirement is 25%. Um, Springfield, in contrast, is 20% um, people of color. And Boston is the one place in our state that requires diversity of its private construction work in addition to its public work. Um, so any project that's over 50,000 square feet, because they're getting a zoning change and they're getting a zoning um, variance from the city, the city says that they need to meet the diversity and residency requirements, and it triggers the Boston Resident Jobs Policy, or BRJP, um, and that requires 51% residency, 25% people of color, and 10% women. Boston also revamped um, its fines and its compliance work to do fines for based on trying. Um, so there, they found that there were contractors who just didn't care and weren't going to meetings and weren't submitting information. And so they would then get fined for each time they weren't doing that. Um, and companies that were working hard, but perhaps falling a little short, they were not being fined for falling short as long as they were showing progress towards working on those goals. Um, 
So given the overall, the low overall numbers of women doing work in our region of 2%, we're, we've been focusing as we've been encouraging cities and towns and private uh, institutions to take to do diversity. We've been encouraging that they start with what the state goals and the federal goals are, the 6.9% and the 15.3%. Um, some are just um, taking out, um, bringing it up, 7%, 16%. Um, so we're far from a tipping point, um, but it will come in the near future. Um, part of the Me Too movement has caused many organizations and companies to re-examine how they're addressing equity across the region. And this is definitely happening with many owners of construction work, particularly in the public sector and then also in private sector in um, colleges and universities have been kind of leading the way on this front. Um, they, uh, you know, have, have paid attention, most of them, not all, certainly, to diversity of their work, of their student body, and then diversity of their faculty and staff, and now some of them are turning to diversity of their contracted workers as well. So Harvard, Northeastern, and Yale have long had requirements around diversity in their construction. Um, Smith, as mentioned earlier, set diversity goals for the current Nielsen project, and we're hoping that that will be um, uh, a first step in doing it for all of their construction work. Wellesley College just created diversity policy for their construction work. Williams College is currently exploring one, uh, as are several others I've talked to and been working with on it in Worcester and also in this region as well. Um, so as, uh, you know, what we're finding, like what Shawmut did with Mount Holyoke, um, the more that contractors can get ahead of the curve and start learning how to do it, um, and showing that their company can meet and exceed uh, diversity goals and requirements. It has the potential to advantage them for work in the future. So I'm going to talk a little now about best practices um, and uh, what works once you've got a project that has a goal or requirement on it. So PGTI, and here's the website for it, um, has literally written and updated a manual for achieving diversity. Um, on construction projects, and it's called Finishing the Job. It has best practices checklists. It has a different checklist for if you're an owner and what are the things that you can do as an owner to achieve diversity. If you're the construction manager or the GC, what are things that you can do in that role um, to increase diversity and meet diversity goals or requirements? And likewise, it has checklists for um, subcontractors, for unions, for apprenticeship programs, and also even for community partners. Their general recommendations are these five points. Um, number one, set numbers, keep to it, and the practice of ignoring diversity and not caring about it. Um, create monitoring committees and invite all interested stakeholders to participate. And so this is what UMass Building Authority and the Mass Gaming Commission have done. They both set up regular monitoring meetings and open these meetings up to the public. All interested parties are welcome, and the meetings have taken a collaborative approach. Everyone is working towards success as long as the contractors are working on the issue. No one's trying to trip someone up or make an example of them. Uh, the frustration only builds when someone's not addressing the issue at all and not paying any attention to it. And these meetings are regularly attended by owners, by the construction managers, um, pre-apprenticeship program staff, some union representatives, and contract subcontractors come in and out of those meetings. The more tradeswomen and people of color are visible, the more uh, potential women and people of color can envision themselves in this work. Um, so we encourage all of uh, interested contractors and owners to make sure that trades events include women and people of color, that recruitment materials include women and people of color. Um, we, uh, PGTI encourages that uh, count and report is a key component of it. Set high targets, make the data transparent and publicly accessible, and track and publicize data trends over time. And finally, lead from where you are. All stakeholders have a role, and don't get caught up on what you can't control, but work from your lane to increase diversity and do your part. Uh, within whatever organization you're working for. Here's some additional best practices. It's a longer list, and I've got copies of it up here um, from their finishing the job document. Um, 
but I'm going to just emphasize a couple of key, uh, key ones, ones that we found UMass Building Authority to use and the Mass Gaming Commission to use to their success. Um, so prioritize diversity from day one means including it in bid documents and talking about it at pre-bid meetings. It means asking about it in interviews with contractors, finding out what bidders' track records and experience are, and of course it means having each sub show up for the first day of work with a diverse workforce. Um, Smith College told me that they were interviewing um, steel erectors for the Nielsen Library job. Uh, they had two companies, the bids were pretty similar, um, and one company in the interview when they asked him about diversity basically said, yeah, I've got my core crew and it's white guys and I'm going with my core crew and I don't anticipate a need to hire anybody else. And the other contractor said, well, you know, our core crew is not too diverse, but here are the different ideas I have around how I can work to achieve these numbers. And so, of course, they went with, uh, with the second contractor um, on it. AOC meetings have been, hands down, have been crucial to um, both the UMass Building Authority and the Mass Gaming Commission's success. Um, MGM and Encore with the Gaming Commission were two huge construction projects. Uh, there was a lot of thought that, you know, the, the size of MGM was 750 to 950 million, depending on what you're putting into the costs of it. Um, there's a lot of thought that, you know, 6.9%, you can't achieve that, um, and you can't achieve the 15.3% in such a big job, um, cause there's not enough people already, uh, in the world doing construction work that could meet it. Um, they exceeded those jobs. Um, they put it in as requirements and they overall exceeded them. They ended the job with uh, around 8% women and 22% people of color um, for those builds. And in part, it was because the Mass Gaming Commission held monthly meetings. Uh, it was once a month, one two-hour meeting for the two casinos, so about an hour for each casino, where they just went through, where are you at? Where's what's going on with the sub? Let's take a look at the sub. who has got a lot of hours, who's not performing. How are we gonna address what's going on there? And it was just a, a, a constant monitoring that um, for MGM and for the Gaming Commission, they found to be successful in then helping them keep the focus on and make sure that they got their subs meeting them. And of course, it was all the, the pre-construction work with each sub, letting them know that it was important and they, it wasn't just a kind of wink and a nod that used to be the case with, with numbers like this. Um, UMass Building Authority uh, holds meetings campus by campus. So all the jobs that are doing construction work at UMass Amherst, there's one compliance meeting held here. They used to do it every month. They actually do it every other month now. Every other month, one two-hour meeting. Uh, I think currently there, are, we'll, we'll get to the list in a minute, five or six projects that are underway at UMass Amherst. All of them are coming to that one two-hour meeting every other month, and they're all exceeding their numbers. They're all goals. There are no penalties if they don't meet it. And because of the effectiveness of what UMass Building Authority is doing, they're all exceeding it. And in part, it's by having just this constant focus where they're being checked in. The owner is checking in with the construction manager saying, what are you doing? What's going on with this contractor? What's going on with that contractor? Oh, you haven't started yet with this project? What's your plan going in to have diversity from day one? Um, So both agencies, um, in both cases with the meetings, um, uh, the information was shared, the information comes out before the meeting. There's an Excel spreadsheet that the owner, UMass Building Authority or the Gaming Commission, gave to each of their construction managers and said, here's how you're gonna track it monthly. Here's how you will track everybody. And then those CMs would give it to each sub um, and say, Here's what you need to do, add to your payroll. Whoever's doing payroll needs to be tracking this information uh, for your workers by gender and by race and submitting them once a month in. Um, and um, so that was a, a key, having, um, having a system for, for tracking the data was very important. High impact poor performers means to focus on the subs that are putting a lot of hours in who are not hitting the numbers. Um, so if you have a sub who's, you know, got a small number of hours and isn't doing the numbers, you don't focus on that one. You focus on the one that's got, you know, 2,000, 3,000 hours and has not been hitting the numbers. Um, 
And what, what UMass does and what the Mass Gaming Commission did and each of the casinos did is corrective action meetings. When they notice that there's a sub who's not performing, they require the owner of that company and the foreman to come and do a meeting with the construction manager and the owner of the project, the UMass Building Authority. Um, and to answer for why their numbers are not, not up to par. Um, key to the corrective action is for them not to lay off existing staff um, and replace them with a woman or a person of color, because that will immediately create a toxic environment on the work site and breed a tremendous amount of resentment. Um, and that's why it's so important for them to have a plan going in um, that they're having diversity from day one. But if they're at a place where they didn't do that and they're not yet achieving diversity, the best practices are is to figure out how as you scale up the work, you're going to continue to be able, you're going to increase with bringing in diversity as opposed to taking people out and replacing them. Or how if you're at the point when you're starting to scale back the work, how you're looking at layoffs with that same perspective as well. Overtime hours are another aspect of work can be doing. Checkerboarding is um, something that still happens a little bit. It used to be a much bigger issue, but luckily a lot of contractors have, um, uh, are cracking down and not doing it so much. And that's where women get bounced around or a person, of, a guy of color gets bounced around two weeks on this job, three weeks on that job to meet some numbers um, and never staying on a job from start to finish. It affects their skills training um, and it leads to people more likely to leave the industry and not stay in doing it. Um, it's um, uh, worth talking about it another time and putting more time and attention to the issue than is currently done is job site training and training with supers and foremen um, and to ensure they're creating harassment free work sites um, and it's really the, the foremen and the supers set a big um, uh, they really kind of like a principal in a school um, they really kind of set the picture on whether you tolerate um, a lot of uh, kind of BS and unprofessional um, uh, behavior or whether they crack down on it immediately and therefore people adhere to the rules. Um, and so uh, training in that regard, um, uh, there's more of it that's needed. The last thing is just to not view, we, we talked to contractors about not, or particular construction managers, to not view WBEs as a solution to workforce diversity. So supporting WBEs can be important to support women-owned businesses, uh, but just because they're women-owned does not mean they're going to be bringing in more women in their workforce. And in fact, there have been studies done that show WBEs tend to employ fewer women uh, in the workforce, the trades workforce. MBEs have a history of hiring more people of color in the workforce, but then they're no different from any others when it comes to women um, and generally are not, not hiring many. So one last best practices slide for as the work starts. Um, I just want to emphasize a few key points for the CMs in the room or people who are going into this work. Um, it's, it's that in reality, ensuring diversity doesn't take a lot of time and attention. Key prep work and key points of intervention are what's needed and can ensure that you're not dealing with headaches down the road. But not putting time and attention into it both prior to your job starting and as the work gets underway can bite you in the ass and result in headaches as the work moves forward and you aren't achieving the goals that the owner wants. Um, so fundamentally important, which is why I've listed again, is starting with diversity from day one. And for subs to do that, you have to have adequate conversations with them prior to the work starting. It's also really important to catch issues and problems early and not wait for monthly compliance docs to come in. So as you're checking in, if you're a project manager and you're checking in with your super daily on a number of issues on your job site, add a question on diversity to it. It's just a question or two asking them if any sub has increased their workforce or decreased it and how that's affected diversity on the project. Um, it makes sure that your super is focused on the issue um, and it keeps you going uh, informed on what's going on and able to adjust as needed um, and to address problems right away. Waiting until monthly compliance reports come in could result in huge numbers of work hours uh, being put in in a project um, by high performing subs without meeting the diversity needs. Um, and then when you have a, a high performing sub, a high impact poor performer, it's meeting with them right away and getting them to address the issue. 
So are the next three slides are uh, UMass Amherst. So this is the current um, list of projects that are underway here. Um, this comes from their latest compliance report. They had a compliant, their every other month meeting was uh, last Wednesday. Um, and um, as, as mentioned, they've followed almost all of the PGTI recommendations. Um, and so they've adapted a very transparent and collaborative compliance style. Um, so here are the key players. Um, here's from their report, um, and I have some copies of it here as well. Um, several of their projects are still in the design phase, so haven't started yet. Um, the construction managers for those projects are actually coming to the meetings already. So they're coming early so that they're seeing what's going on, what's being required of them, and so that they can start making a plan to make sure they're bringing in diversity from day one. So here's their current numbers for the ones that are in construction. Um, some of the projects, they're, they're mostly, uh, other than the research lab, which just finished up, the others are just kind of on the starting up phase. Um, and um, while UMBA's diversity projections have all been goals, again, no penalties, no consequences, essentially, for not meeting these numbers, they're all exceeding them. Um, all of these CMs started out with diversity from day one. Um, they all attend the compliance meeting every other month and come prepared to answer questions and to address their performance. Um, when UMBA adopted the best practices from PGTI, they, they adopted it um, about three and a half years ago when they hired their latest compliance officer, a woman named Maggie Drummond. Um, and the state goals had existed prior to that, um, but UMBA, um, but until she came in and she started those regular meetings, uh, there, were no, there were no meetings about diversity. There were goals on jobs. Uh, they got asked about it, but that was about it. And most of their jobs had less than 2% women um, on them, which is what the industry average is. So the goals existed before, but they weren't paying any attention to them. The people of color numbers were decent, as is reflected in the industry, but they weren't as high as what is here. Um, so setting the goal is important, but implementing oversight and enforcement is key. Here's the um, Excel spreadsheet of how it looks and breaks down uh, with subs on a job. Um, so this is just one example that I pulled from uh, the report at last week's meeting uh, for Worcester Dining Commons. Um, each CM tracks monthly and tracks project to date uh, for each of their subs. And then they also break it down by trades so that it's looking at if there's an issue with a certain trade that is not bringing diversity in. Um, and when, again, when a construction manager is chosen, UMBA gives them a copy of this Excel spreadsheet for tracking. So I've talked to you enough. <laughs> I'm going to turn this over to Stephanie. This blurry picture here is Stephanie on the job. Um, she took it the other day. Um, she's going to share her experience of becoming a carpenter, her experience doing this work, and we'll then open it up to questions. And um, as I mentioned, I've got documents for anyone who's interested in them. And I'd just like to finish with asking you all to become allies in this work um, and to lead from where you are and use your influence with owners, with end users, as you go into the work world if you aren't there yet. Um, and figure out ways that you can incorporate diversity uh, into the projects that you're a part of. Um, and where, wherever you work or end up working, figure out how, how you can open up opportunities in this field. So, Stephanie. Hello, my name is Stephanie Stevens. I'm currently working at the Student Union Center for uh, Bar and Bar Construction doing safety. Um, so I've been in three years. I'm about halfway done with my um, apprenticeship classes to become a full journey person. Um, I, when I Let me start over. So how I got into the union, I had no prior experience with carpentry. I had really no background in construction whatsoever. A friend of mine had a flyer and said I was, I was really having trouble finding work. I was getting ready to actually leave Massachusetts to go back to Texas where I was stationed to try and find work down there because I just couldn't find any work after going to college, even going in the military. There's still it was just, you know, it was really hard for me to keep my head above water. And so my friend brought up, you know, the 
the union building. I had no idea what the union was, what type of benefits they had. I met with Lisa, and she kind of broke down for me all the the process I'd have to go through, all the rates I would get, all the benefits I would get as joining the union. And it completely, 100% changed my life. Did a complete 180. I have had steady work. I have health insurance. I'm actually thinking, you know, in the process of starting buying a house, a house, which I never thought, I thought I'd be in an apartment for the rest of my life. Like, never, ever, be, you know, thought of becoming a homeowner. And it's all just very, very real in my grasp, right around the corner. And it's all because of the union. It's all because of the change. And becoming coming in with zero experience, they did not, it didn't matter. They're like, we'll teach you. We'll teach you everything. From how to put on my tool belt, how to put on, you know, how to use a hammer all the way to the saw, to a grinder, to all these different type of equipments, driving all the different lifts, everything I've learned all in just, you know, under three years. They've already already taught me all of that stuff. And when you go to school, you get to work in between the time you're there. Every three months, we go for a week out to Millbury. And we, well, you know, every time it changes, we learn something new. We get different certificates. We get different licenses that we need that will help us get more jobs, make us more marketable to these companies looking for carpenters. And in that time, in between those three months, while you're working, you're, you don't get laid off. You don't lose your job. The, you know, your, your boss understands that you're going to school and that they hired an apprentice. So they're very flexible with you. It's just, you know, you go for a week to school and you come back right on Monday like you never left. And it's just, it's an all-around great experience because now as I'm learning, I'm going to school for free. They pay for everything. I pay for for my tools, which is, it's really, you know, com, you know not a huge dent in my pocket because I'm working this whole time. So it's actually helping me. I use the tools every day. So it's not like it's an inconvenience at any point. I'm not buying stuff I don't need or I'll never use. And there's so many different opportunities of being a carpenter. You know, I've done drywall. I've been with a concrete company. I've done safety of several times. I was on the MGM project for two years. I worked steady, which was beautiful. I went in for an interview and I, two days later I started. I had no idea what I was doing, but I caught on quite quickly. So I got lucky in being able to just looking at a brochure and having a meeting with Lisa found something that I absolutely love to do. And I would have never known if it wasn't for just something simple like this, I would have never known that I'd like to do carpentry and I'm actually pretty good at it. And it's, you know, something that I can now actually have a career. I don't have to worry about, you know, working at family dollar, like, Oh, am I going to get late? You know, if I'm going to get fired because I'm five minutes late or, you know, if it's just a revolving door doing retail and, just waking up every day dreading, like, oh, here we go, you know. Coming in, you do your eight hours, you know what to expect. It's great. You're working outside sometimes, sometimes you're inside. And being able to do this is something, I have something to look forward to. I know I have money going into a pension, into an annuity, and I know that there's an, there's an end game. I'm not just going to be working and working until I can't anymore. And they have a great health package, so... As my body gets a little run down through the work, because the work is hard. It's not, you know, it's not for the faint of heart. You're putting in a lot of work on your body, but you get great health coverage. So, it's, you know, you get, you know, free massages and stuff like that that are covered underneath your health, you know, the health package. And being able to go from the military into something like this, it's very similar as far as the discipline of being on time and having a great work ethic to where you know you have a task to do and you're going to do it and you're going to do it as quickly and safe as possible and you're not going to just kind of like mosey around like I can get to it later. It's not, you're not really fans of that. <laughs> you know, you have deadlines, you have stuff to go, but it's a, it's a great thing. Sometimes you'll be at a job for, you know, three, four months, it'll be great and move to another one. Sometimes you get lucky as far as I've gotten lucky because of the diversity requirements is why I've been able to stay at MGM for two years, how I got on the job here. It's great to have. It is hard to deal with sometimes because they see a female minority and then they, they find out I'm a veteran. They're like, oh, now that's why you're here because you meet the numbers. And then they see me work for five minutes and they're like, oh, no, that's why you're here. You know, so it's just it, it's having those numbers gives us an opportunity just kind of put our foot in the door, just gives us an opportunity to have 
an equal opportunity with everyone else. And they can just, instead of just looking at us like, oh my gosh, here's another woman. Oh, we're going to have to do all the work or we're going to have to carry her on our back. And by having those requirements of putting on there and making the owners and the, you know, the general contractors be more open to it, they get to see that 90% of the time we're great workers, whether we're women or whether we're a minority, you know, whether, you know, veterans kind of, you know, they like the hot but you know, it doesn't, it, it, it doesn't, it takes the blinders off. And so the next time they have to hire a woman, they might not be so like, ah, you know, dragging their feet about it. They, you know, it's giving us just a little push so we can say, be on the same playing field and get the same opportunities that are out there and get to capitalize on. So we have not one, but two of the coveted wow. ECT water bottles. Thank and thank you, you very much. <laughs>